Oh, hey, let me introduce you all to York College's first official Speaking Green event. We have several great talks planned for you today that cover a wide variety of sustainability topics. We thank you all for joining us, and without further delay, let's begin. We had to fish all around the net for our next guest. Please welcome Enna, who will be speaking on ocean acidification. Hello everyone, my name is Enna Haltigan and I am a sophomore civil engineering major here at York College of Pennsylvania. For Earth Day today, I'm going to be sharing with you about oceanic and atmospheric acidification and what we can all do as a community to tackle these issues. Before we get started, I want to sincerely thank the professors who have contributed to my sustainability education, both at the Marine Academy of Technology and Environmental Science and at York College of Pennsylvania. Without them, I would not be able to share this presentation with you today. All right, let's start with an overview. The main topics I'm going to cover are the anthropogenic, meaning human-driven, causes of acidification, and some of the effects it has on infrastructure, human health, and the environment. We're also going to dive into some current and potential solutions. So what is acidification? Today I'm specifically referring to acidification by carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere and absorbed by the oceans, where it chemically reacts with water molecules to form carbonic acid, which drops the pH. The following chart shows that over several millennium, the oceans showed an average pH of around 8.2. This was the confirmed pH of the oceans prior to the Industrial Revolution. Now the average pH is at an 8.1. This may not seem like a large difference, however, according to the EPA, this seemingly superficial change symbolizes a 25% increase in acidity. Acidification is driven by the carbon cycle. Carbon is stored mostly in organic material, sediments, the atmosphere, and the oceans. The vast majority of carbon is stored in the Earth's crust underground. However, human activities are releasing carbon from storage into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. The ocean is able to absorb this excess carbon dioxide from the air. These are the severe ways in which humans release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and into our waterways. Modern agriculture uses a lot of chemicals. From pesticides to fertilizers, we are constantly altering the natural balance of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus in the soil. These excess chemicals react with water vapor in the air to create acids that contribute to acid rain. Deforestation has been devastating primary forests worldwide. In the United States, less than 7% of primary forests still exists. This is important because every tree we've chopped down over the years has released carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The transportation industry has been burning fossil fuels for ages. They're one of the leading emitters of carbon dioxide. As the need for personal vehicles increases, the carbon footprint of the automobile industry also increases. Fossil fueled electricity emits about 1.87 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide each year in the United States. As always, there are consequences for the actions we decide to make. When chemicals such as nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and carbon dioxide react with oxygen and water vapor in the air, the results are acidic compounds which fall to the ground in waterways. Acid rain is capable of discoloring and corroding infrastructure, as seen on the Statue of Liberty. When those excess chemicals reach waterways, it can cause what's known as an algal bloom. Algae thrives on excess nutrients. And when a body of water is full of nutrients, it's called eutrophic. Thick layers of algae can block sunlight from reaching the bottom of bodies of water, thus killing aquatic plants. Algae also has rapid turnover, meaning they bloom and die quickly. As organisms die, they require oxygen to decompose. The algal bloom sucks the oxygen out of the water. Oceanic organisms are at risk of death as well. Carbonic acid is strong enough to dissolve shells of mollusks, plankton, and shrimp. Many shellfish will not be able to make it past the larvae stage as the ocean continues to acidify. Climate change is also contributing to ocean acidification. As the average temperature of the Earth's surface warms, the frozen tundra becomes less frozen. Permafrost melt is dangerous because it reveals organisms that have been frozen for hundreds of years. These dead organisms require oxygen to decompose and they release greenhouse gases such as methane. In addition, research by the U.S. government via NASA, National Geographic, and other scientific organizations have proved that natural disasters will worsen by intensity, 
frequency, and endurance as climate change continues. This also means heavy rainfalls and flash flooding. Floods lead to infrastructure damage, contaminated soils, power loss, and pollution in the nearby waterways. All of the automobile fluids, fertilizers, and pesticides, heavy metals, and oils will have a direct path to the ocean. Now that we've thoroughly discussed the negatives, let's look at what changes we have implemented to reduce our carbon footprints and stop oceanic and atmospheric acidification. Tree farming and afforestation is a wildly popular carbon drawdown method. Trees have tons of benefits from being habitats to helping to prevent flooding and erosion to sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. Afforestation is a slow but sure way to decrease carbon dioxide levels. Aquatic habitat, wetlands, and rainforest restoration projects are underway worldwide. For example, the Barnegat Bay in New Jersey has a project called Reclaim the Bay, which farms clams and monitors harvesting to harbor a healthy population. Many farmers have switched to nitrogen-fixing plants, such as clover and alfalfa, which get rid of the need for fertilizers. Nitrogen fixers take nitrogen from the air and convert it to a form that can be absorbed by other plants in the soil. Next, I want to share easy ways to reduce your carbon footprint to lessen your impact on oceanic and atmospheric acidification. Add meatless meals to your diet. There are many online resources that show affordable recipes and cooking tips for those looking to eat more sustainably. Reduce your energy consumption. Remind yourself to power down when you're not using electronic devices. Be aware of what you're investing in. Source locally and ethically. Also, the less packaging waste, the better. The biggest thing you can start today is to share what you know with others. Help others be aware of how much solid waste and energy they consume and ways to reduce it. Being sustainable is how to ensure future generations have the resources they need to thrive. Looking into the future, there are lots of obstacles we will need to overcome if we want to stop oceanic and atmospheric acidification. A carbon tax could help us become more aware of how much carbon dioxide we actually emit. Better public transportation will reduce the need for personal vehicles. Seaweed farming is also a solution being researched that could help us draw down carbon. More efficient disposal technology could ensure a higher percentage of recyclables are actually recycled. These are just a few of the many solutions being discussed today. The world needs innovators because modern problems require modern solutions. This Earth Day, we fight for a sustainable future for those who can't, for plants and animals, for those not even born yet, and for those who depend on the environment for their industries, such as fisheries. We may just be one drop in a vast ocean, but when enough drops come together, there's no doubt we'll be able to make waves. Thank you. Woo! I guess you're now schooled in ocean acidification. Did she do a good job of reeling you in? Oh, come on. I'm eeling over with all these puns. Continuing on to our next guest is delighted to meet you guys and share a little bit about vegetarianism, the meat industry, and sustainability. Say hello to Allie Alwood. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Alwood, and I hope that you're having a happy and healthy Earth Week. Today, I will be talking about how the meat industry is butchering the environment. As a quick little overview, I will first be introducing myself and the meat market itself. Second, I will be talking about the impact that the meat market and the meat industry has on the earth as a whole. And then third, I will be talking about the implementations that we can all incorporate in our daily lives to make the earth a greener place. Like I said, my name is Allison and I have a major in marketing and dual minors in advertising in Spanish. I've been vegetarian for two years now, so I like to learn new things every single day to make this lifestyle easier and happier and healthier. Lastly, I'm also a member of the Sustainability Ad Hoc Committee for the York College Student Senate. To talk about the meat industry, I decided that it's better to sort of divide it up into two separate areas. First, you have agriculture, which is dealing with the livestock and the crop cultivation as a whole. They sort of interchange since you need the crop cultivation, like the grass and grains, to feed the livestock and maintain that lifestyle. 
Also, there's the livestock itself, like I've said, which includes cows, chickens, pigs, goats, etc. They all need to have breeding and raising grounds to produce meat. Also, there's the industrial side where the animals are butchered, um, packaged, and then transported to any sort of uh, retail facility. So if we look at the meat industry or just looking at meat as a whole, we may not think of the impact that it has on the planet or the ecosystem. We may just be looking at a nice cut of meat and thinking about the cookout that, cookout that we'll have with our family or the drive through at McDonald's. Four areas that the meat industry directly impacts, which is pollution, water consumption, waste, and land clearing. To start out with pollution, cows actually produce and release a lot of methane, which is a gas that is not good for the atmosphere. It contributes to a lot of the greenhouse gases that we've all heard about. Also, cows do produce manure, which is turned into fertilizer. That's okay, but fertilizer isn't necessarily spread in the best way possible. It includes a lot of machinery that releases the fertilizer into the air, and the particles are toxic and contain a lot of bacteria just making the oxygen um, in the ecosystem a lot filthier. Then, of course, like I said, the meat has to be transported, which includes a lot of semi-trucks and vans. The exhaust from those motor vehicles are released into the atmosphere as well. Then you have um, the factory fumes where the animals may be butchered and packaged. They release a lot of CO2. Like I just stated, livestock, especially cows, produce a lot of manure. These excessive amounts of manure cannot all be repurposed into fertilizer for crops. This means that there are a lot of areas outside of grazing grounds which are called waste lagoons. These are basically big basins of waste that contain all of the toxins and bacteria, and due to the amount of rain, or storms that are in the area, this can cause runoff and that bacteria can therefore go into nearby lakes and streams, which could be bad for the ecosystems and the fish and algae. Also, when butchers do prepare the meat, a lot of the cuts are thrown away or discarded as they may not be completely edible or desirable for the human to eat, therefore producing a lot of food waste. Or these meats need to be packaged. You actually see this packaging consisting of styrofoam and plastic as it's the most popular ways to package beef to ensure its freshness. We know that plastic is not good for the environment as it is not all completely recyclable or could be repurposed. Moving on to water consumption, we may not think of the amount of water that livestock need. You need water to cultivate all their crops, which is the food for the livestock. They also need to drink, especially during the summer months when cows and chickens and pigs, etc. will be especially thirsty. They drink a lot of water. Also, meat markets where they butcher the animals also have to hose down a lot of the facilities, which takes a lot of water as well. And according to PETA, it takes more than 2,400 gallons of water to make only one pound of ground beef. And lastly, we have land clearing. We have forests, wetlands, and savannas. These are all areas of land that are basically determined as carbon sinks. And these are basically any natural reservoir that absorbs more carbon than it releases and lowers the concentration of CO2 from the atmosphere. Since all of these areas of land are being destroyed to clear way for more grazing ground and area for the meat industry, we are losing that feature and basically adding more CO2 into the air itself. And according to the Washington Post, 
12.4 million acres of forest, the equivalent of more than five Yellowstone National Parks, are cut down each year to clear room for industrial agriculture. So, a lot of people may be thinking, well, what can I do? I'm not saying that you have to go vegetarian or vegan or, or adapt a complete meat-free lifestyle. That's definitely not the case, and it's definitely not going to happen. What you can do is cut back on your meat consumption. A lot of people choose certain days of the week. They consume meat specifically. Just cutting back, each person will be able to contribute and help the earth. Or you can eat plant-based substitutes. They vary in variety and they taste just as good. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Woo! You grow, girl. Leave it to her to plant some killer sustainability knowledge on y'all. Let's take a leaf of faith and jump into the next person. His talk is sure to shock you and maybe even brighten your day. Next, we have Max Rubin sharing about sustainable energy and policy. So I'll let him take charge. In a world undeniably under attack by climate change, we often ask ourselves, how can we make positive change? Today, I will be talking about the Green New Deal. Many of us have heard about the Green New Deal, but are unsure about what exactly this type of legislation would do for our country. I hope I can clear up uh, any confusion about the Green New Deal and the fight against a better policy to combat climate change, as well as show what the Green New Deal does, provide some cool ways policymakers can sustainably improve the environment. Um, and yeah, that's really it. So let's dive right into it. And uh, just a quick note before I begin. Many of these ideas are not original. In order to learn what the best path forward is, we don't need to invent or even reinvent the wheel. We just have to use what has been proven to work. So to understand the Green New Deal, we must understand why people are against it and how to rally up support for this type of change. So why are people climate change deniers and how do we change this most importantly? So one big takeaway from reading On Fire, The Burning Case for Green New Deal, um, it's a book by Naomi Klein, as the vast majority of deniers of climate change don't necessarily begin by disagreeing with science. Many of the leaders in the anti-climate change movement have noticed that the rapid and drastic reduction of emissions can only be done by radically reordering our economic and political systems in ways antithetical to their free market beliefs. The fear of changing the status quo, changing their income, or changing their status in society has driven these people to lead movements against what's in the best interest of all people in our country and in the world. So these people have used their calls for more freedom and less legislation to motivate others to take the same beliefs. However, much of these so-called ideals of corporate decentralization and protection of our nation's working class would be greatly benefited by the Green New Deal. So how do we break the chain? The, to receive support behind ideas, a lot of the time we invoke historical precedents to inspire change on common ground. Many refer to the Green, uh, to the Green New Deal, they refer back to the New Deal um, in the 1930s and the Marshall Plan, um, which was for the reconstruction of Europe. These two programs responded to a great problem with a great solution. Another way to evoke the feelings of historical events that have been uh, is to uh, another way to evoke the feelings of historical events that inspired change is to do mass demonstration marches or strikes. So now that we understand that there's this divide between people who fear um, that the Green New Deal will ruin our economy and those who fear that it's our only hope to save the world, um, what is the Green New Deal? To understand the Green New Deal, let's flash back to the New Deal in the 1930s. The New Deal was a series of legislation uh, following the Great Depression under Franklin Delano Roosevelt that resulted in 10 million people being employed, and it gave most of rural America electricity for the first time. Today, the Green New Deal will transition millions of workers into clean and efficient energy jobs. The main ideas aren't just carbon taxes. It means changing energy production food consumption and production, transportation and construction. There are six key points to the system uh, the Green New Deal revolves around. And here's the first one. Public infrastructure. Rethinking transportation. That's what it is. This is not suited for private business because it requires large upfront investments that only the government can make. 
private industry simply does not have the money to create a high speed rail or to create tons of roads and bridges on their own. And there's really not many ways to sell that. Um, but we can contract companies to do these things through the government. Um, so examples of rethinking public transportation. Uh, well, we need to rethink roads, bridges, and highways for buses, um, cars, and bikes. And there's a, you can learn about this in about um, Robert Moses. Um, he was, there was a biography called The um, Power Broker by Robert Caro. And it goes through how this guy changed, or he was in charge of construction in New York. Um, and a lot of the uh, bridges that he built were unpurposely below um, the height of a bus so that buses couldn't pass through. And low-income families, um, many minorities, were not able to get to certain locations that mostly uh, people wanted to be restricted to rich people. And um, so, yeah, we need to rethink our transportation. Uh, also, far-reaching high-speed rails, uh, expanding the Federal Highway Act. Um, and additionally, the Koch brothers. For years, they've slowed down and at times halted the progress of our nation's transportation system. Uh, so unless we have urgent government funded programs that aren't influenced by the Koch brothers um, or other lobbyists like them, it'll take decades to undo their intentional mistakes. Uh, the second point is economic planning. So that means transitioning jobs uh, into clean energy through government funded training um, or government loans to create and assist in the creation of um, clean energy cooperatives using the Cleveland Evergreen model, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the third point is corporate regulation and incentivization. Um, so there's a few points under here. Um, first is carbon emissions caps for companies. Uh, the second is promoting a zero emission vehicle um, manufacturing. The third point is subsidizing solar and wind energy as well as responsible land stewardship. And fourth point is cutting subsidies to dirty energy. And then finally, um, no new coal-fired plants, and also not creating any more pipeline projects. Uh, we know how destructive that can be for the environment. The fourth point is uh, international tr about international trade. Globalization and free trade is enabled by transportation that requires mass consumption of fossil fuels, resulting in mass CO2 emissions. By localizing trade, we ensure the protection of local farmers first. Now, the next point is consumption. Promoting, this means promoting industries not in the consumption of material goods. So like teaching, education, caregiving possessions, professions, leisure activities such as like parks, fields, and gyms, and um, activities that bring construction jobs, maintenance jobs, and revenue. The next point is taxation. This means carbons and emissions taxes on the fossil fuel industry uh, as income and cutting government spending towards the military and eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. Now we have the Evergreen model or the Cleve model, which is also known as co-ops. So my favorite talking point um, is this subject um, and it's a way of accomplishing the Green New Deal's goals without disrupting our economy. Energy companies are owned by the workers in this situation, or in this model. So this will prevent labor from being outsourced, um, which results in keeping the profits in the communities, which contribute most, rather than in a house on the hills or in the suburbs. The nonprofit Evergreen loans uh, slash uh, nonprofit Evergreen, they loan out money and funds for projects. The first um, three that they've started up are a solar energy company, then a laundry company, and then a hydroponics greenhouse to help or to keep food local and sustainable. The workers of the company share the ownership and decision making of those companies. The nonprofit makes the money back through company profits, which are also driven by worker input and determination as many company profits or as the as the company profits, their profits um, increase as well. So after six months, employees are able to request to buy into the company. Then their fellow employees vote you up, um, and this process will continue as you move up the ladder, if you want to keep moving up the ladder in the company. The system promotes hard work because each employee hopes that the work will translate into more profits and a better chance that their peers would vote them up into a higher level of management. 
So what the government can do is subsidize or um, loan out nonprofits who are interested in starting up a uh, Cleveland model. And that way we can get started on transitioning people into clean energy jobs. Um, next, we need to get, oh, there, okay. <laughs> next, we need to get rid of um, legislation that prevents the growth of the clean energy, uh, clean energy industry. So in a uh, research project for an internship, um, I found that community solar programs uh, enable families who cannot host solar panels on their own um, properties to support a solar installation elsewhere and be directed directly credited for its generation on their electric bill. Under Pennsylvania's current net metering regulations, community solar paneling or community solar panels is not permitted. So the House should enact a uh, House Bill 531 because um, currently oh, there's a uh, mistake here. Um, it should say that it without it um, that Pennsylvania prevents community solar programs, but uh, House Bill 531 would authorize community solar and encourage the inclusion of low to moderate income individuals in community solar programs. So if we pass legislation, smart legislation, that enables people to have community solar programs or that incentivizes co-ops, um, it'll be great. There'll have there'll be great strides towards the Green New Deal. So we don't really necessarily need to wait for it to happen. Um, so here are some of the books that I, on the topics I mentioned. Um, the first one um, on the Green New Deal, it's On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal by Naomi Klein. Um, second is Energy and Civilization, Vaclav Smil. So this is from like the very beginning of history um, up to today and how we like, how energy has evolved, um, have become more efficient, how much um, room we have to improve and uh, if we can improve by that much. And then the Robert Moses reference, obviously the power broker by Robert Caro. So I um, apologize for any like mistakes, pauses, dog barking in the background. Um, but other than that, thank you for watching and um, hope you learn more about the Green New Deal. Happy Earth Week. I'm hoping Max was able to enlighten you all about green energy. I thought his performance was simply electric. Next up, we have the number one expert on number two business. Our next guest is Austin, coming to us with a flood of knowledge about gray water systems. Hello everyone, my name is Austin Denlinger, and today I want to talk with you a little bit about gray water recycling. I really want to outline how it works and the benefits it has on humans and the environment. Now, what is gray water? Gray water is gently used water in homes that can contain dirt, grease, food products, or other household cleaning products. Now those household cleaning products are more like soap because gray water usually comes from bathroom sinks, showers, tubs, and washing machines. The water doesn't come from toilets. If you draw your attention to the right here to the picture, you can see that clean water is what we drink and um, what we use in our sinks when we wash our hands. Now, gray water. Gray water is what comes out of those sinks and out of the shower once we're done cleaning ourselves. So. That water doesn't contain toxic chemicals or have any excrement like feces in it. Black water is what you flush down your toilet that has feces or toxic chemicals in it. Now, why recycle gray water? Well, an average family of four uses about 400 gallons of water per day. So that's 70% of that water is used inside and 20% of that water is used from toilets of just flushing them. Now about 95% of that water used is gone down the drain, whether that be flushed or just going down the sink and right off to the sewer. Now the water used outside and in toilets can all use gray water. So these can be recycled back through your home and save water. And 52% of that water in your home can come from recycled water. So you can save 50 gallons of water right there. Now multiple uses for gray water uh, can be used inside your home, such as toilets, uh, irrigation outside, and many other things that I'll get into once uh, we go along. Now, how can gray water be used? Irrigation uh, water in a yard. Now, this saves time watering plants and delivers them a controlled amount of water. If you have a tank that slowly seeps out water into the soil, this can make sure plants are hydrated at all times and you can quickly shut it off if it rains that day. Now. With that comes fertilizing soil beds for plants. 
The dirt and bacteria in the water act as a good fertilizer to plants. Now you will have a filter on your gray water so you don't put like soap and things that could kill uh, certain plants back into the environment. But if there's that dirt and stuff in there, that can be used like as manure is on a crop field. Now the flushing of toilets. Toilet water does not need to be completely clean to use. I don't know about you, but I've never drinking toilet water in my life. Now the only problem would be with your pets. You would have to close your toilet to make sure that your pets don't drink it because there is some dirt in there that could still affect them. And outdoor spigots. Outdoor spigots can be used to wash cars or other needs. Now this would have to be with a better gray water system where you would have to put more filtration into it to get all of that dirt out. And then that's where the possibility of washing machines comes in. If you have a genuinely good filter and a genuinely productive system, you can use this in washing machines and save even more on water. Now, how does a gray water system work? Well, this is a little outline here that shows perfectly how it can be used in your homes. So as I said on the first slide, you can see this little gray tube coming from the sink and the washing machine, the shower and the bathroom sink. Now that's gray water from your bathroom and laundry, and that can flow into a tank that you can have underground. So it's not like you can have an ugly tank sitting in your backyard, just sitting there full of gross water. No, you can put that right underground and no one ever has to see it or know. But you will know that you're being sustainable. So the black tube you can see is the overflow to the sewer. Now gray water can only be stored for about 24 hours or else bugs start to get in there and mosquitoes because of the distilled water that has some dirt in it. Now the overflow to the sewer connects directly with your lines from the toilet and the kitchen. And then the red line, which we have last, can go up into your outdoor irrigation system, your toilet, or your washing machine. Now you can see as the line fades because it definitely depends on how good of a filter you have. Um, the better the filter, the farther down that line you can go because the irrigation system doesn't require as much. The toilet is sitting in your house, so it has to be a little cleaner. And then right on the washing machine on the end, now that's where we have to get into really cleaning the water to make sure that we're okay to use it. So how do you store gray water? Well, like I said, gray water can only be stored for 24 hours or the nutrients in it uh, will be lost and it breaks down. Now, what that means is all the stuff that is in that water will settle to the bottom and now we have a tank full of dirt and mud and now we can't put water in it anymore. Well, most systems transfer water directly to gardens and plants through a branch system as you can see in the bottom left. Now that right there you can see, you can have a uh, offset to that which will immediately send that to the sewer or send it to your plants depending on if it's raining or not, which is perfect for making sure the plants have the right amount of water. Now, if you have it going directly to your plants, there's no need for a storage tank or anything. There's just piping. Uh, other small storage tanks that drain slowly into soil beds is another way for this. So if you have a small tank that sits underground, you can easily have that drain into the soil beds, or you can even use gravity and have it flow into the tube or flow into the tank and then flow to tubes downhill. Now, simple ways include a dual pipe that can control the water where it goes with a lever or switch. So this is really easy to do. All you have to do is connect the sewer and the gray water pipe. And now you can control whether you're sending it to the sewer or gray water, depending on what you need. So if you look in the bottom right, here's another system we can use. So as you can see, the filter is applied on that from the washing machine and the shower. And we have a holding tank in the bottom. And that gets pumped up to another tank up top where we use gravity to flow it down into the toilets. So there's multiple different ways you can do this system and you can choose whatever works best for you. Now, what are the benefits to using gray water? We've seen how it works and what we can do with it, certain ways we can implement it into our homes, but like, why should we do it? What are the benefits? Well, of course, number one, it saves water. It reduces the amount of water used in homes and it saves the environment because now we're not drawing water from all those underground wells that we may have or different things like that. Um, and it saves money as well. Like systems are inexpensive to install and operate on their own. Uh, it cuts your water bill in half. Like I said, you can save 52% of water. Uh, you pay for only fresh water used. Like you can easily save money, half of your water bill on this. And 
healthier plants. I mean, the dirt and things, like I said, it's like spreading manure on a crop field. The dirt and nutrients from that water can help plants grow stronger and healthier. And then lastly, it reestablishes re the natural water cycle, uh, making a fresh water strips natural nutrients from the water. And then the dirt and nutrients from the gray water that we have can help those plants grow. Thank you, and I hope I enlightened you a little bit on gray water and how it helps humans, the environment, and why everyone should implement it into their home. Thank you. Well, that just stunk. Ah, I'm just kidding. To keep things flowing nicely, we'll move on to our next guest. She came, she saw, she contoured. Comb, comb put your hands together for Sarah, speaking on reduction of single-use plastics in the beauty industry. Hey, everyone. My name is Sarah Zavatsky, and I'm the owner of Green Daisy Soaps, a handcrafted soap and cosmetic company in Spring Grove, Pennsylvania. I'm also a chemistry student at York College. Today, I want to talk to you about a big problem that we are currently facing in the U.S. and all over the world, single-use plastics in the cosmetic industry. In 2015, the U.S. government passed a ban on the use of microbeads in all applications, especially as the use of an exfoliant in cosmetic products. By 2018, these microplastics were completely phased out, but that's just in the United States. Countries all over the world still use microbeads, which dumps nearly 8 billion tiny but toxic microplastics into the ocean every day. They pose a threat to all aquatic life, not just in the ocean. You may be asking, why am I talking about these tiny microplastics when they have already been banned from the US? The point is, is that with enough pushback from the consumer, change can occur in industry. Without so many people coming together to fight the microbead issue, nothing would have changed. We need to do the same for single-use plastic packaging that most personal care items come in. Whether it's shampoo and conditioner or toothpaste and mouthwash, conventional petroleum-based plastic is the main component of product packaging today. In 2017, the cosmetics industry produced 76.8 billion plastic packaging units, which contributed to the approximately 6.9 billion tons of total plastic waste in the world today. The scary thing is, is that nearly 6 billion tons of the total waste never saw the inside of a recycling bin. Many beauty industry leaders have said that they will try to reduce plastic use in the next five years, but the key word is try. The industry has stepped up in starting recycling campaigns, but at the end of the day, the recycled plastic still becomes waste. The only way we can fix the problem of the buy and throw away mentality is by making consumers aware of the pollution they are contributing to. Ultimately, the ideal solution is eliminating plastic packaging altogether. The most straightforward approach to cutting out plastic altogether would be to replace it with glass packaging because of its infinite recyclability. However, it's not that easy. Glass is a lot more expensive to produce and ship and not cost effective for businesses. Glass costs nearly 10 times more than the equivalent plastic packaging and is a lot heavier than plastic, which increases shipping costs and the amount of energy used and fossil fuels used to transport it. Glass is also prone to breaking during shipping, so the product may not always reach the distributor or consumer in usable condition. It's not a cost-effective switch. In the early 2000s, a bioplastic created from corn, known as polylactic acid, or PLA for short, made its debut into the packaging world. Producing PLA uses 65% less energy than traditional plastics and generates 68% fewer greenhouse gases. However, there are more downfalls than bright sides to this alternative. It is said to be biodegradable, but only decomposes in a composting facility where the compost can reach 140 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 consecutive days. 10 days! Most consumers do not have access to a facility like this. 
There is also no evidence that it degrades in normal landfill conditions any faster than petroleum-based traditional plastics. More recently, oxo-biodegradable plastics and shrink films have been developed as an alternative to traditional single-use plastic packaging. These plastics degrade between one and three years, which is comparable to most natural materials. When they biodegrade at the end of their useful life, they do not break down into mi microplastic pollutants, but only into water, carbon dioxide, and biomass. As a business owner of a company devoted to eco-friendly alternatives to traditional packaging, I did a lot of research about OXO biodegradable films available for product use. I finally settled on one called BioLefin, which biodegrades in one to three years in normal landfill conditions. Each bar of soap that I make and wrap is wrapped in a biodegradable BioLefin film. It biodegrades in one to three years in normal landfill conditions and keeps the package safe as well as keeps the smell in. I also wrap my soaps in a post-consumer recycled paper label that can be recycled again once you open your bar of soap. And the paper label provides an extra layer of protection between the outside world and the precious soap on the inside. There are 238 million Americans on average using a bottle of body wash every two months, so that means that they use six bottles per year. That works out to be nearly 1.4 billion plastic bottles being thrown away just from body wash use alone in the United States. If at least half of the Americans that use body wash switch to solid bar soap like we sell at Green Daisy Soaps, we could significantly reduce our plastic waste. In the last few years, waterless products have swept through the beauty industry, specifically shampoo bars. In traditional beauty and personal care products, such as lotion, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, and toothpaste, and other products, contain at least 75%, if not more, of just water. So we're shipping water in plastic containers all over the world when we could be saving time and space by using more concentrated solid versions. These newly innovative water-free products are essentially the same product as the traditional liquid product that you would buy. They're just concentrated into a solid little bar. They are usually either completely package-free or packaged in a plastic-free packaging material such as post-consumer recycled cardboard or paper, glass jars, metal tins, or biodegradable film, like my soaps are wrapped in. Not only do these waterless products save you money since they are concentrated, but they also save space in your shower, in your luggage when traveling, and when shipping. Most importantly, they are completely plastic free. The solution might be in the product itself rather than the packaging. Two years ago, I decided to add a solid line of hair care products to my normal product line. I carry shampoo bars, which last between 60 and 80 washes depending on how long your hair is and how much shampoo you use each time. I also developed a solid conditioner bar. Both of these are packaged in plastic-free options. Our shampoo bars are packaged in a post-consumer recycled cardboard box and wrapped in a recyclable paper label. Our conditioner bars are packaged in recyclable aluminum tins. So either way, you are completely eliminating plastic from your hair care if you choose to use solid options packaged in alternative plastic-free ways. Many small businesses offer a recycling program for containers that their products come in, and Green Daisy Soaps does too. Once containers and jars are returned, they are thoroughly sanitized and refilled with new product. I offer an incentive to my customers for returning the jars and containers that my body scrubs and lotions come in. When they save up 10 jars or bottles and return them to me clean, they earn a free four ounce scrub. Even if the packaging is plastic, it forces consumers to be mindful of their waste habits and gives them a reason to recycle. So what does all of this mean for us? We as consumers need to be more educated about the waste that the 
billion dollar cosmetics industry produces and how the buy and throw away mentality must stop. For any change to occur in the industry, there needs to be a substantial amount of kickback from the consumer and smaller businesses. Even if half the consumers in the United States switch to products that are alternatives to traditional products packaged in plastic, we can make a significant impact on the amount of plastic waste we produce as a country. If you are interested in learning more about my products or visiting my website to learn more about me and my company, you can check us out at greendaisysoap.com or find us on Facebook and Instagram. Now that she's built up a good foundation, we're all ready to change the world. All puns aside, me and the entire Sustainability Committee for Student Senate want to thank every listener and presenter for making this all possible. We really hope you learned something and had a great time while doing it. We all make an impact on this world. You might as well make it a good one. Have a good day, night, whenever you choose to watch us. And remember, stay sustainable. Go Spartans!